Lost Art with Andrew Cox, retired Marine Master Gunnery Sergeant. TheLostArt.Podbean.com Get some merchandise and help support the podcast and getting our veteran voices out for all to hear. Now on all major podcast platforms, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe. Be a guest. Tell your veteran story. Discuss your veteran business or organization. Email TheLostArtWithAndrewCox at gmail.com Andrew Cox, a Till Valhalla Project Ambassador. See the project story at tillvalhallaproject.com. Thank you for tuning in. Please enjoy the podcast that's given a voice to our veterans. The Lost Art with Andrew Cox. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Lost Art Podcast, that podcast given a voice to our veterans. I'm your host, Andrew Cox, and today we'll be having a My Veteran Story with Marine veteran Scott Grimmer. I've got mountain man, Marine retired, Scott Grimmer. Scott, how you doing? I may not have you. Oh, oh there you God, are. Okay. Good. I should All be right. good. I'm on Starlink. <laughs> oh, well, you're probably, it's probably on my end, to be honest with you. So uh, hopefully I caught the intro in mind. But mountain man, Scott Grimmer here, re- Marine yep. retired. How you doing? Great. Great. Good to have you. Good to be on your show. Yeah, man. I, uh, I'm excited to hear all about it. Uh, you were telling me about uh, right before we started about your uh, pet eagles, you know, uh, bald eagles you got right there by your house that like to like to have a conversation or two. So hopefully we'll get to hear some of that. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hey, man, uh, let's kind of start uh, at the beginning. Like, where did you grow up? Uh, what was that like? And then how did uh, you kind of join the Marine Corps and get in the military service? Sure. Uh, so I was born in Juneau, Alaska, right here where I retired. And uh, I grew up uh, here in Juneau and uh, moved down uh, uh, down south to uh, Wrangell, Alaska, which is in between uh, Juneau and Ketchikan. If anybody's familiar with the panhandle over here. It's pretty big. The Panhandle's about the size of Florida, uh, with the population of about twenty-seven to thirty thousand people in that wow. in that distance. Um, so, uh, 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 as a teenager, uh, my parents moved down to uh, uh, Western Washington area, Seattle, uh, Olympia area. And uh, I met my wife in uh, high school in uh, Central Washington. And, uh, yeah, nothing significant. I played sports in high school. I did football, wrestling, uh, did a bit of baseball, uh, did martial arts. I did several different types of martial arts, uh, taekwondo, karate, uh, did Greco-Roman wrestling, uh, things like that. And nice. uh mostly did a lot of working uh my my uh parents put me to work doing a lot of different things so i did uh masonry work uh stone laying i did uh laying linoleum and carpets uh things like that i also did roofing uh and uh after graduating high school i uh wanted to uh, go do some mechanic work and so uh, I went to college to uh, learn a mechanical trade, and uh, the <clears throat> I ended up uh, uh, well around that time. Nine Eleven happened, mm-hmm. and uh, I was I was still in school, and uh, my cousin uh, had came back. He was uh, with First Recon Bravo Company over at Pan- Pendleton, and what used to be there, but it used to be in uh, Margarita, Camp Margarita, uh, right. but uh, they don't have recon there anymore. Uh, but he uh, came back and, and uh, came back home on leave and talked to me, and I was convinced that I needed to join. And yeah. uh, without asking my wife about it, I went to the recruiter's office and uh, signed papers and everything, and then came home and told her what I'd done. And uh, she agreed that that was not a bad deal, and it was uh, it it was uh, something that she would support. And 
Uh, luckily, I have a very supporting wife that has always supported me, and um, yeah, especially while I've been gone and all the different times that I've been gone away from home, and uh, that was just the beginning. So after I, I uh, joined the Marine Corps, I went to uh, boot camp, and uh, uh I guess there wasn't really anything significant about boot camp. I can't remember a lot. I've had a lot of TBIs. I can't yeah. remember a lot of stories and details. But I do remember that uh, I modeled a lot of the things that I did uh, when I became a drill instructor after my first enlistment off of what my drill instructors did. And uh, unfortunately, they did a lot of heinous stuff. And so that's what I ended up doing. <laughs> and I got in a lot of trouble, but I didn't get in too much trouble. I can say that now because I passed the statute of li limitations with the UCMJ. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I guess I could say those kinds of things. But uh, yeah, that was boot camp. I went to... Uh, so uh, let, let's let me ask you a question there. Uh, now, when you went to Bouquet, how old were you? Because you went to college. I was, so I was uh, 20, about to turn uh, 21. I was 21 okay. when I went into uh, MOS school. OK, so a little bit older. Uh, and and as far as you can remember, is was it uh, was it a culture shock for you doing that? Or was it just kind of like, oh, yeah, it is what it is. I had imagined that everything was like, I guess I didn't really have expectations. And so I had imagined that it was like the worst thing imaginable. Like I thought that it was like, um, I hadn't seen full metal jacket at the time. And so that's not yeah. what I thought it was like, but, uh, and so I just got secondhand stories from people and things like that. And uh, all of them told me not to expect anything and I'll be fine. And uh, I, I don't know. I guess uh, I didn't have any expectations. And since I was uh, a little bit more mature than some of the other uh, guys going in, uh, a lot of the things that were going on and, uh, you know, uh, games, and discipline things. Uh, I didn't have to deal with getting jacked up because I was pretty mature and didn't do stupid stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, that's what it was. I, I was, uh, and so, uh, the drill instructors made me a whiskey locker recruit because, uh, one of my drill instructors came in all the time cause he had a Volkswagen bug. And uh, he had all kinds of electrical problems with it. He knew I was a mechanic because uh, they'd ask people what they did before they came in. And so uh, I ended up fixing by virtue of talking with him on and off while I was on fire watch like every other night or whatever. And he would come in and, and ask me what this problem was. And I'd go, well, did you check this? And like. Pretty sure I helped him install his entire wiring harness and figure out his carburetor and everything. <laughs> but I so you basically when... helped him build it, build it up. Yeah. That's nice. And uh, in third phase, he drove it to work, and uh, I remember looking out, and he like drove it in, and like was like it like made it really obvious, and I was like, yeah, that must be it, you know. But I thought that was pretty much. <laughs> That is awesome. Well, that's that's good. You put your uh, your knowledge that you learned in college, you put it to work there in boot camp. That's that's good. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I went. I uh, signed a, a contract to be a mechanic, and uh, so I ended up going to uh, Motor Team Mechanic School in Camp Johnson, and mm -hmm. uh, Camp June, North Carolina, and. Um, all I remember was it was like the easiest education I've ever had because <laughs> they basically tried to cram an associate of science and automotive degree into like two and a half, three months, <laughs> which you can't do. And at the time I had like, uh, I think I had three of the ASE certifications which were current. And so, I mean, I was real sharp on all that stuff and 
uh, I mean, I did. I didn't want to like highlight myself because I had learned in boot camp that that was a bad idea, and so I didn't yeah. like do too good at school. But uh, I, it was it was really easy uh, to go through and do all that uh, those things. But I mean, uh, those skills ended up paying off. Uh, you know, uh, have paid dividends throughout the years uh, having those hand skills. You know, um, absolutely, but. Yeah, uh, I went to uh, my first duty station in uh, Camp Pendleton, and uh, I don't even remember what it was like, uh, 03 or 04, and they had just came back supporting uh, the initial Battle of Fallujah, Mm. and uh, I heard all the war stories and everything. And we were super short-handed because uh, I went to my first unit was uh, first TSB. Mm. Uh, they changed it from TSB to CSSG to FSSG. I think they call it CLB now. Uh, but yeah, it. Uh, they it was they like need to a, pick a name and stick with it. That's what yeah, they need to do. It's a logistics unit and. Uh, uh, I remember at the time, it was crazy. Um, our our sergeant major, uh, the battalion commander was a marathon runner, and the sergeant major had a three hundred PFT. Oh my uh, so, god! Yeah, and like they would skunk everybody going on runs, and I just remember there was one in particular, um, and. Uh, we would PT like five days a week. We didn't do like the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like other people got to do. And they would take us out running the hills in Camp Pendleton every day. We would go oh, at wow. least two to five miles. And because um, I wasn't much of an idiot, my uh, my staff sergeant at the time uh, pulled me in and he was like, you know, you're not much of an idiot. Because, like, the first month I was there, I became mechanic of the month because I was just fixing all of their stuff because I knew how to yeah. fix stuff. And uh, I didn't use any technical manuals or anything. I just knew how to fix it, right? And so uh, he was like, hey, you're not much of an idiot. You know, if your PFT and stuff wasn't so bad, we could put you on a board. And so I was like, well, what do I got to do? And he was like, well, you should PT at least twice a day, three times a day. And so... Uh, in the morning, I would run. At lunch, I would run to the pool, swim like 500 meters, and run back. And then in the evening, I would go to the gym and lift weights. And I did that and raised my PFT from, I don't remember what it was. It was like a 250-something uh, to a, it was like a 293 or a 295 in like wow three months. Whoa. You were from working like my, hard, man. Yeah, from my boot camp PFT score. Uh, and yeah, I got put on a uh, meritorious board. And um, I went on a meritorious board. And it was like the full gambit where we uh, had a had like a wall locker inspection. Oh, wow. uh, we, we had two Old uniforms. School. Yeah, we had two uniform inspections. You got inspected in camis. You got inspected in uh, the seasonal uniform, which was uh, Charlie's at the time with like the short khaki shirt and ribbons right. and stuff. And uh, we uh, we did drill in the motor pool and uh, they did like guide on manual, which I knew nothing about and was sure that I had completely bombed. Um <laughs> And uh, the last thing they had, to, oh, we ran a PFT, and then the last thing they had us do was they had us uh, report in at the battalion to do a board. And um, I had been studying the BST battle skills book at the time thinking, oh, okay, I'll memorize this and then I'll be good because they're supposed to ask questions out of the BST. None yeah. of the questions they asked were um, were out of the BST. Sorry, this is my dog Bruce, my bloodhound. That's he, okay, uh, man. He's welcome. He's out and about. Uh, and so I went to went through the board, and they asked some BST questions, like what is what are the, uh, 
Sorry. <laughs> what are That's the five good. different types of grenades? What, yeah. uh, what, you know, like what, uh, what are, what is this color mean on a map? Things like that. And, right. uh, then they started asking weird questions like, where is, where do you, f or in, on top of the general's flagpole, what do you find inside the ball on top? Right. Uh, and then one of them, oh, and then the sergeant major asked me, what color was his wife's underwear? And uh, I was like, I don't know, and I'm not going to find out. That's what I said. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think that that must have been the right answer because uh, I was like the last person in. They pulled everybody back in and they had everybody except for me walk out. And they told me that I won the board. Um, and so that was uh, that was my experience with uh, getting promoted to corporal. Very uh, nice. Within, I think it was a month or two after getting promoted, uh, I got on a slate to uh, go uh, go with, on uh, deployment to Iraq, and uh, I can't remember what it was. They 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 had all of the deployment mechanics filled. And so hmm. uh, they asked for people to volunteer. And I was a go-getter and was eager to deploy. And so uh, I volunteered to go to do whatever. And uh, I had no idea what I was going to do. I ended up getting attached to a security company that was attached to CLB7 or FSS2, whatever they called it at that time. It was uh, the yeah. guys from the logistics guys from 29 Palms. And okay. then uh, we was attached to RCT7, which oh, was wow, okay. in the Western Al Ambar at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we, what I ended up doing for my first deployment was uh, they, they showed up as a secure, we was a security platoon. And I was like, well, you're a machine gunner. And I was like, uh, I hadn't fired a machine gun, barely any in MCT and didn't remember anything. And so uh, I went into the armory and did assembly, disassembly, uh, going through immediate remedial action on the weapon systems and everything over and over and over again until I had it down. And I just I remember going on like the uh, first com couple combat patrols and like. I was like super nervous that I was just going to do something wrong or like something was going to happen and it was going to be my fault. And uh, yeah, uh, but it, it ended up not being that bad of a deployment. Uh, I remember going all over the place. Uh, we went to, we ended up hitting a lot of IEDs, we ended up finding about 10 times more IEDs than we hit. Um, but it was, it was a, every deployment I did was a summer deployment and it was sweltering hot. I remember that year. And somebody had one of those global index things and it maxed yeah. out on the bottom because it only goes to 120. And yeah. uh, somebody had a digital thermometer, and the and the outside air temperature on one of the patrols was 142. Ooh. And I was like, this, "This is so miserable." And at the time, uh, the gunners they was using napalm IEDs, and so the gunners had to wear these monkey suits that were like a frag suit, and it was like, imagine like a frag vest, but like it goes from your your uh, ankles. All the way up to your flak jacket, and then wow. you have your flak jacket on, and then you wore flak jacket arms on top yeah. of that, and then, uh, and then because it was like they was using a pump, everybody had like a fire resistant polyclava on their face, and oh man, I was I remember that day I was just sweating buckets, and. It was it was it was absolutely crazy, um, but uh, it was yeah. It, I just remember everybody was hanging the socks with water bottles, like a wet sock yeah. with the water bottle. I don't like drinking cold water, and so 
Uh, that was kind of weird, but yeah, I just remember like I probably sweated three gallons in one yeah. day. Um, but yeah, that was it was that was uh one of the experiences on that deployment. Um, oh, I remember my birthday on that deployment. That was one that stuck in my head. We was uh, we was on a patrol back from Haditha Dam. And mm-hmm. uh, everybody remembers the shenanigans with Haditha. Like, uh, we were, like, coalition forces and U.S. forces were not very well liked uh, in the Haditha area. And uh, th- we got blown up a lot. And, uh, like, the road going uh, south to, like... Uh, I don't remember what it was, Takatum or something, uh, was yeah. like the place south of that. Like it was, it was just potholes of like IED blasts through the whole road. Wow. It would, it was, uh, it was, there, it was like driving around and you like, they was like swerving back and forth to like avoid potholes. And like some <laughs> right. of them were massive, like you could fit a Humvee in one. And, uh we was on our way uh we was on our way to uh coming back from haditha and ended up uh <clears throat> stopping to check out an id and mm-hmm. as soon as that happened uh we uh got caught in a complex ambush they started uh hitting us with mortars they started shooting at us and uh, uh, shortly after that happened, they're like, oh, go, go, go. And they're, they're trying to get people to move. The tire and everything was on fire and uh, the, the hub was just glowing red. And they were like, oh, we can't move this. And I mean, like, it was completely loaded down. You can't drag something like that. You're not going to leave it. And so I was like, is anybody going to do something about this? Like, I'm just listening to the chaos on the radio. And it's a couple of vehicles in front of me. And so I'm like, whatever. Uh, You know what? Like, I told whoever it was that was... uh, Sitting in the A driver's seat. Hey, uh, get up in the machine gun uh, turret right now. And I jumped down there, grabbed my uh, grabbed my M16, and ran down uh, to this vehicle and opened the door. And these guys, like, were so lost. And it was like these blank stares on their face. And I was like, "Do you have your SL3 gear in 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 your uh, in your seat?" And they had no idea what I was talking about. So I like it. Oh, man. To move and I like opened the seat and I started grabbing stuff. They didn't have all their SL3 gear. Luckily, uh, they had uh, they had like the little thing so you could do a limp home on it. it basically, it's like you, you compress the spring and it lifts the axle off of the ground so it doesn't touch the ground. And uh, they didn't have anything. And so I, but I had a a crescent wrench, like a 16 inch crescent wrench. And so I was slowly cranking this up by using a crescent wrench. And once it started like getting weight loaded because the tire was trying to lift off the deck, I had no breaker bar or anything to try to like get it off the ground. So I used the buttstock of my rifle and I shoved it it through the freaking crescent wrench and was just cranking on this thing and got it, uh, got it, uh, above the, where the ground was so that it would hover. And like on the last crank, uh, it shattered my buttstock completely. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so I'm thinking, well, I really can't use this uh, for a whole lot as we're getting uh, shot at. And though I just as that whole thing was happening, I can just look off in the distance and I see the mortars walking themselves up and they're just getting closer and closer. And it looked like they was just coming for me. Right. And I'm just like, I got to move faster. And it was like 120 plus degrees outside. And I was just like, I don't care. Like, I'm just going to have to move as fast as I can. And, you know, adrenaline's pumping through your body and things like that. And uh, yeah, but 
Anyways, ended up getting it moving. Uh, they like ended up just going off road with everything, and we got out of the area. Uh, the security element in the front uh, ended up pushing around to freaking uh, go engage, and uh, it, it de-escalated within like five minutes of uh, me being able to get it to move. But um, yeah, that was my birthday on my first deployment. That was a cool, uh, cool time. Yeah. Um, well, that's one heck of a birthday. I, I'm yeah. not sure anybody can top that one. That's pretty good. Um. Uh, so we came back from my first deployment. Oh, one of the things I, I had like a running tally of how many patrols we did on the deployment. It was like a 10 month deployment. And, uh, we was all trying to, we was all counting like the number of patrols that we had been on. And in that time frame, I was just counting, counting, counting. It was something ridiculous, like over 200 or not 200, 170 combat patrols in wow. 10 months. It was like, it, it was almost like every day, every other day. Like it, yeah. it was, yeah, it was, it was crazy. And there was some times where, you know, there would be so many casualties in one of the other security platoons that we would be on. We would have no breaks for like a week because we was covering down on all their stuff because they had to have time to like regroup and, and, uh, you know, situate themselves. And so, right. Uh, yeah, it just, when that kind of stuff happens, it just, you know, like you got to pick up the pace for, for other people, you know, and we had no problem with it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was a heck of a deployment. Um, but we came back, uh, I got promoted to sergeant. Uh, I was back for three months. I volunteered to go on a uh, transition team. And so uh, I got attached to a uh, transition team. Uh, we did training uh, for a few months. Uh, and we was in charge of uh, training uh, uh, Iraqi uh, military and Iraqi Border Patrol in the, uh, like, northwestern Al-Ambar province uh, up, right. by, uh, up by, up uh, by, uh, I can't remember where it is. It's the town that's, like, right by al uh where uh, 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 Jason Dunham uh, was oh. deployed. Right. Um, so... Uh, we, so we went up, uh, we went out there and, uh, that was it. Every day was interacting with the Iraqis. We was on this small cop that, uh, we were us and a small contingency of like a cook, a guy that ran everything, uh, a guy that ran calm. And, uh, we had like a, I think it was a, a, a platoon of Iraqi uh, Iraqi army that also was on the camp that we were at. And uh, so we interacted with them quite a bit. And I got to learn a lot of culture and understanding for, uh, you know, the Iraqi people. And it is completely different in that area, you know. Okay, but. And so uh, the it, it was kind of nice uh, that I was able to get deployed in that particular area because uh, in that area, if you go up north of that, it's Mosul or Mosul, mm -hmm. and uh, like all of the almost all of the people that live there are Kurdish. They're mm. they're not uh, Sunni or Shia, and uh, the Kurdish people are completely different than everybody else that lives in Iraq. They, hmm. uh, you know, they walk and talk very Western, like Americans wow. they like to drink. They like to smoke. They uh, enjoy, you know, enjoy, you know, conversations and are open to conversations. And they very much despised 
the previous regime in Iraq and were super motivated to engage in uh, anti-terrorism uh, in the in the country to be able to, uh, you know, work and do their part. And right, uh, yeah. they, were, they were very motivated. Um, hmm. I remember one of the uh, specifically one of the guys that we had out there. Uh, he was a platoon sergeant for uh, one of the forts that was out there. And uh, <clears throat> this guy was old. Like when I think old, you know, he was probably my age now, but like he looked old. <laughs> uh, and uh, before that, he was uh, uh, Egyptian special forces. And uh, he would take, he would, uh, he would do, he had trained in karate and he would do. Uh, katas every morning and uh he would and then he would take his platoon out on a three mile run in boots and heels every wow. day wow and uh those guys were in super good shape <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, especially uh, in that heat man oh yeah uh a lot of that area was uh close to the border and so we did a lot of night patrols uh, because that's when things were most active because people right. aren't uh, dumb enough to try to cross like a lot of open terrain uh, during the daytime. It's super obvious. Yeah. Um, and it was a pretty well controlled border uh, out there. Um, but the um, <clears throat> the uh, so we did a lot of patrols at night and uh I remember uh, there was one, we would go out and do patrols with them. So me and two other guys would rotate um, like one off to lawn uh, mm -hmm. with doing patrols every, uh, every couple of nights with them to like train them how to do patrols, how to react to, you know, like, you know, how to do different combat maneuvers from, you know, the ground from your feet. And so, right. um, it was crazy because I was reverting back to like MCT information that yeah. I had like I needed to get brushed up on real quick. And I was the expert on all of a sudden. Yeah. And uh, and so I was uh, I was teaching them how to go through and do patrolling. And uh, so one of us would be uh, with the with the scout element in the front and one of us would be with uh the with like the uh element leader or squad leader um mm -hmm. uh, like just kind of shadowing him and telling him what things to look for or how what hand and arm signals to do uh, how to control right. you know what was going on with the patrol and um there was uh there was one night patrol we did where it was zero percent illumination and if you've ever been in zero loom with cloud cover, you can't see in front of your face. And like NVGs don't do a whole lot. And yeah. uh, they and we had like I don't remember what they were. They were the monocular ones that like go down right, yeah. and it's like the monocular. Um, and they were about a thousand times better than what uh, our counterparts had. But like we were, it, I don't know how we made it. But they had a dog and they always they treated that dog like crap, but they would let that dog go on patrol with them and the dog would lead the patrol. Wow. Because the dog knew the routes that they would take. And so uh, I was with the scout element and I remember we just followed the dog. <laughs> and I uh, and I would recognize, you know, different, uh, you know, things as we was going through. And, uh, you know, it was just like, oh, yeah, OK, we're on the right track. And we just followed the dog for the patrol. We had, nothing happened during that time. But uh, it was kind of funny that, you know, we just ended up following the dog for, uh, you know, the patrol so we could get back. But yeah, uh, it's a good thing that a dog was there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There was, uh, oh, I got to tell this story real quick. Um, almost started an international incident with Syria on that deployment when uh, we was on the Euphrates River. So the Euphrates River cuts in and goes into Syria at the, like, the top of the Al Ambar province. <clears throat> and uh, there's a bunch of, uh, like, 
up until that point and the year before, I don't remember who it was. They did this thing called the island hopping campaign because uh, the terrorists were using the river, the Euphrates River, to uh, to smuggle and uh, transport explosives, ammunitions, and weapons. And uh, uh, at first, they was using boats and things like that to like try to get around on. And then after a while, uh, they started getting smart because they'd get caught. It was super easy to see somebody in, in a boat just zipping down the river. And it was like, OK, what are you doing? And so, like, you know, the Iraqi <laughs> army guys would just get in their boat, speed boats and zip over there real fast and, you know, find out what was going on. But so they started putting them in barrels and floating them down the river. And then oh they would God. they would use the current. And they would end up on these islands and then they would go back to those islands and uh, pick those things, pick the stuff up. Right. And so the island hopping campaign was going through and basically clearing those islands out and, and stuff like that. And right. there was one island that obviously was not cleared out because half of it was in Syria and it was right in the middle of the Euphrates River. And uh, so. We had this great idea because it was still happening that like a lot of that was happening on that little island. And right. it was, I mean, it, if you ever been to the Euphrates, it turns from barren wow. desert into like uh, a just like a, a tropical paradise oasis immediately mm -hmm. within like, uh, you know, hundreds of yards. And right. that's what it was like. It, you know, there was like fig trees and uh, and, uh, you know, different types of, uh, you know, lush vegetation and reeds mm -hmm. and stuff on the island. And uh, we had done an operation to uh, to cut a line across that island and basically like mow everything from one side to the other, which is about it was about 150 meters. And mm -hmm. uh and basically Constantina wire it so that uh, it was it was a secure island. And right. we get over there and we had hired like, I don't know, it's like 50 uh, locals that was in a village nearby. And um, uh, we was uh, we'd gone through and, you know, we was basically tried in security. There was like a trail that went, there was like three trails on our, our side, the Iraqi side of the Island. And there was mm -hmm. one main trail and we found a donkey with a, uh, with a cart uh, on the Island. Somehow a donkey got on that Island. And uh, so we had gone through and did everything and had uh, everybody cut all the reeds down and, and all that kind of stuff. And we stand up and put triple strand Constantina wire across the whole thing and uh, just as we're about to wrap it up, uh, I'm looking around. I'm starting to you know, like gather tools and gather the people and everything uh, because it's a logistic thing. There's only one place to get off of that island because the reeds are so tall and stuff. And so the only place you could get a boat was like a quarter mile down the island. On right. that little trail that's like this big with like... <laughs> you know, eight, 10 foot uh, reeds on both sides that are thick. And uh, so we, we start getting everybody together. And I remember looking and there was this one old guy that was like a supervisor. He didn't do anything, but I remember looking around and I looked at him and he was looking around, he was smoking his cigarette and then he looks back and forth and he flicks it right into this dry hot mound of reeds oh no and that thing went up in smoke like instantly it was like this massive blaze and that fire started spreading aggressively and so we're like okay everybody get to the other side of the island now and uh by the time i was like it was myself and and uh, one of my buddies that uh, was <clears throat> trying to get, gather everybody. We were staying behind to make sure everybody got off and got out of that area. And yeah. so by the time we got on that middle trail, 
the entire freaking side of like everything was torched and it was like just this <laughs> massive blaze coming towards us and it was within like 50 feet you could just feel the heat coming and oh uh we God. have everybody running down this trail and i just remember as we're going there's people running and i look behind us and the donkey is freaking running full bore right at it <laughs> and like we try to get out of the way and then it's just plowing people over and people are like trying to like just falling into the reeds getting stuck and stuff and uh Around that time, once it starts getting into where they did cut, they start having cooked off rounds uh, go off. Oh, no. And and so the Iraqis thought that it was the Syrians shooting at them. And the Syrians (laughs) thought that it was the Iraqis shooting at them. And so they're starting to shoot back and forth uh, uh, at one another. And in the midst of that, uh, like this fire is like just torching and going crack because everything is dry on that island. Uh, yeah. It's just like you can hear like, you know, explosives cooking off and just causing big booms, and which is engulfing the fire, making it hotter, spreading it faster. And uh, we are just flying down that island, trying to get everybody off. There's like we're loading twice as many people that fit in a boat onto a boat. And uh, we get to the dock and we're putting every last person in there and then they leave. And then I look around with my buddy and we're the only people left. And we had a couple of poly buckets and we're like, crap, uh, is the boat going to come back for us? And uh, (laughs) the boat was not coming back for us. So we put our weapons, uh, broke them down real quick and put them in the poly buckets and like use the poly buckets as a flotation and uh swam across the river and when we got in the water i i could just feel the heat like you know like when you're really close to a bonfire how it's yeah. like hot on your skin that's how it was and uh we just ended up swimming for it and uh it was not a problem but uh that was yeah i just how far being... how far would you say you were swimming Oh, it was, it was not far. It was maybe a hundred meters at most. Okay. But I mean, it was a hard, strong current. And uh, if it wasn't for the fact that I already was a pretty good swimmer, I probably would have been way down current, but (laughs) I wouldn't have been, you know, like by the time I got to the other side, but um, yeah, that was, uh, that was quite the experience. And I just remember uh the uh major that was in charge of our uh our uh transition team he probably got his butt chewed out by the freaking uh base ceo over at alkyme and uh because i'm it basically started an international international incident um and uh (laughs) he was in charge of it but uh yeah that was a great time (laughs) oh my god that's a great story I like it. Wow. So uh, let me ask you this. Uh, so that was a uh, 10 month deployment, if I'm not mistaken, is what you said. And I can't tell if you're here or not. It cut out. Yeah. OK, you're there. OK, it oh, yeah. was a 10 month, 10 month deployment, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, OK. Right after I got well, during the deployment, I was doing my reenlistment stuff. And uh, I went through, did my re-enlistment, and uh, the monitor didn't want to release me. And uh, the unit was going back on another deployment within a very short amount of time. And uh, I had volunteered to go to drill instructor school. And uh, it went up. They denied my request to go to drill instructor school. And so I used it as my re-enlistment incentive for my first Ooh. re-enlistment Good. and uh, got a seat and three months after we got back i was at di school man you know what yep. uh god bless your wife uh i mean that's two deployments back to back and then pretty much another you know three-year deployment you know yes yeah wow. that's uh that's what it was like 
uh, listeners out there, if you're struggling, need some help and uh, anything like that, the VA has some great resources. You can always reach out, dial 988, press option one. You can also text 838-255, or you can go to veteranscrisisline.net and click on that chat icon. Any of those are going to put you in contact with somebody that can help you out. But remember, one veteran life loss is one too many. I care about you. I know Scott cares about you. The whole veteran community cares about you. So please reach out for help. And if you're out there and uh, maybe you're not struggling, but you might see somebody else, just just as a reminder, go out and uh, talk to this, talk to people that you serve with. Ask them how they're doing. And if they do need help, then please uh, assist them in their time of need. All right. With that, Scott, one last time. Thank you. I appreciate it. To all the listeners out there, stay motivated. Change your socks.